Welcome to part three of how sales really work. In this section we'll be focusing on velocity made good or VMG. VMG forces us to think not just about the sales but also about the performance of the keel, the hull, and the rudder, all those things under the waterline we often forget about. Velocity made good is how fast we're moving towards a destination on average. So this is different than boat speed, which is just how fast we're going through the water. Velocity made good requires that we make a compromise between the performance of the hull, keel, and rudder under the water and the sails on top. And different boats, of course, are going to be trimmed differently to maximize VMG. Keep in mind that every numerical result in this presentation applies just to the J32 test boat, although the general principles apply to any sailboat. Here's a graphical example of a velocity made good calculation. In this case, the place we're trying to go is directly upwind. Of course, sailboats can't sail straight into the wind, so we have to tack back and forth. And this diagram shows the position on a starboard tack. The boat is actually pointed along the blue line, but of course the wind pushes us somewhat to the side, so the actual track <coughs> through the water if you look at it from above, is followed by the red line. And the difference between where we're pointed and where we're actually going is the leeway angle for this particular tack. The velocity made good is just a component in the direction of our destination. Mathematically, you take the boat speed and multiply by the cosine of the tack angle, and that's the velocity in the direction of our destination. You can determine the leeway angle for your boat at any time by just looking at the path the wake takes behind the boat. Here's an example where the boat isn't heeled and you can see that the wake is pointed directly back from the boat. So the leeway angle is approximately zero. Here's an example where the boat is heeled about 10 degrees. And now you can see that the wake isn't going straight back but it's canted off at a slight angle. And that difference between directly behind the boat and the angle of the wake is our leeway angle. In this third example, the boat is being worked quite a bit harder and healed about 25 degrees. And now you can see a fairly significant leeway angle, perhaps 10 degrees difference between straight back from the transom of the boat and the angle to which the wake is following. If you continue a line going, following that wake going through the boat, and follow it out the front of the boat, that wake points directly towards your real destination, even though the bow is pointed somewhat to the sun. Here's a wonderful picture from the Spanish magazine Compass. This beautiful sloop is being sailed uh, pretty hard, heeled about 45 degrees. You notice all five of the seamen are looking straight ahead, probably expectantly thinking that's where they're going. But of course, at that heel angle, there's got a lot of leeway, and they'll really end up somewhere way over off the right of the picture. The formula in the middle of the chart is worth thinking about. As an approximation, the leeway angle the boat makes through the water is about equal to some constant times the boat's heel angle divided by the boat speed squared. So for the J32, if we measure the angle in degrees and the speed in knots, K is about 10. So let's think about that. The boat heel, as we saw in section one of this presentation, is a very direct measurement of how hard the boat is being pushed sideways through the water. So it makes sense that the more sideways force there is, the bigger the leeway. So that's boat heel. And then why boat speed squared down below in the denominator? Well, the surfaces underneath the water are airfoils similar to our sails, and so the forces go up as the speed squared, just like the forces on the sails do. The ability of the keel to resist leeway is determined by how much force it can exert, and so that's why the boat speed squared divides the constant that determine the leeway angle. This formula has a lot of implications to how we sail the boats in different conditions. If the speed of the air is very low, then the boat speed will be low. 
and it's very important to get the boat moving to reduce our leeway angle. That's trying to increase the denominator to reduce leeway. Once we get to high wind speeds, the boat speed is sort of fixed by the hull speed, and so now reducing boat heel is the key to reducing the leeway angle, and we can often do that by trimming our sails or even reefing the sails. Now we're going to look at a few simulations of what's going on underneath the waterline. In this case, we're just looking at the hull. Everything above the deck has been stripped away. The boat is moving on a close-hauled point of sail in the direction of the black line heading, but it's healed 30 degrees, so it's actually being pushed sideways through the water. So the real track through the water is shown by the red line, and the difference between the two is about a 10 degree leeway angle. Now we've put our nose underneath the water line, and we're just looking at surfaces that correspond to where in the simulation is water that's at low pressure? So you can see this lumpy surface on the keel covers most of the keel surface. That whole keel has produced a low pressure area that's pulling the boat back towards the windward direction. That's helping resist the leeway. You can also see a small low pressure region along the leading edge of the rudder with a similar effect. Now we're looking at the low side of the boat and are highlighting regions where the water is relatively high pressure. You can see a large band right around the leading edge of the keel, a small one on the rudder, and there's also a pressurized region right up near the bow on the hull. All of these are again <coughs> forces which are going to tend to resist the leeway track of the boat through the water. But you'll notice that the position of these is towards the bow. They're not symmetrical relative to the keel or the hull. And so these forces are also going to tend to cause the boat to round up. In essence, they're torques rather than simply forces at the center line of the boat. Here's a two-dimensional view of the pressure profile of the water near the keel, where we've sliced the keel about halfway down its length. Uh, similar to what we saw with two-dimensional simulations of sails, the pressure differentials tend to accumulate right up near the leading edge of the surface. And in this case, we have both a high pressure on one side and a low pressure on the other, both contributing to resist the leeway uh, track of the boat through the water. But because they're up near the leading edge, they also produce a torque, and this is what tends to cause boats to round up. Going back to VMG, let's imagine thoughts that might go through the helmsman's mind on a port tack heading towards an upwind destination. If the helmsman heads up, that of course will take the path closer to the destination, which is good, but of course the boat speed will go down. On the other hand, with the sails generating less force, they'll be reduced heel and reduced leeway. So those are good, good effects. On the other hand, if the helmsman falls off, the path will take us further away from the destination, but the boat speed will go up because the sails will generate more forward force. Unfortunately, the sails are also going to generate more sideways force, which will increase heel angle and increase leeway. If you think about this compromise at different wind speeds, you realize that the answer isn't always the same. In general, as the wind speed goes up, you tend to point higher and higher, and as the winds get lighter and lighter, you tend to need to fall off because heel is no longer a consideration, but you need to keep the boat moving in order for the keel to be effective and to reduce leeway. The next two charts we're going to be looking at first boat speed and then velocity made good from the point of view of the helmsman and also somebody trimming the jib. So this first chart says boat speed, and the x-axis is the apparent wind angle, so the helmsman can head up towards the left or fall off towards the right side of the chart. The different colored lines are different jib sheeting angles, where the green line is sheeted very close to the center line, all the way out to the yellow line, which is a very relaxed jib. And you can see from the point of view of making the boat go fast through the water, you really want to fall off. And we probably haven't carried the chart far enough because 
out there at 35 degrees, looks like we want to relax the jib and probably fall off even farther to get the boat going as fast as possible through the water. So this plot shows exactly the same data, except now we're looking at velocity made good, not just boat speed. And so as you can see, instead of pushing us towards falling off, velocity made good pushes us towards angles that are very close to the wind. The optimum here is around 27 or 28 uh, degrees of apparent wind. And with that come very tight sheeting angles and very flat sails. Now this plot, the numbers here are just for the J32. If you look at other boats, the more easily driven the hull is, the more to the left the optimum occurs. In other words, tighter sheeting angles, tighter, uh, closer to the wind, and also flatter sails. If the hull is, is heavy, like a cruising boat, well then the optimum GNG will be at a larger angle, and that will correspond to more open sheeting angles and fuller sails. So in summary, it's interesting that the knot meter tends to drive you towards falling off and easing the sheets. And this is a very easy way to sail, but it doesn't make as much progress towards an upwind destination. When you focus on velocity made good, it encourages you to be very close to the wind, which is a fairly difficult way to sail. You're always on the edge of pinching. And as we saw in, in section two of these videos, sailing close to the wind requires that we achieve this nice state where the air ahead of the boat is swept in at a, at a positive angle that gives us good pressure differential across the jib. Anything which disturbs the air in front of us, or even a small wake, will break that connection of the upwind air over our sails and we'll end up basically losing that advantage. So the helmsman, when working on maximum VMG, is very busy and always sensing, does he have that connection? And if not, falling off, reestablishing that good airflow and trying to coax it back up to a tight angle again. So a few notes about wind speed. One thing that many people don't realize is that in any condition from about two knots up to even a hundred knots, the path the air takes around our sails is not affected by the wind speed. The air behaves essentially the same way. Now, we have to tighten the, the lines, the sheets, in order to maintain sail shape as the wind speed goes up. But what the air is actually doing, as long as the sails don't change in shape, is exactly the same. On the other hand, the force generated by the sails goes up very rapidly. It goes up as the square of the wind speed. So if you go from two to four knots of apparent wind, you end up with four times the force on the sails. So these, these sound a bit contradictory, but they're not. If you think about the pressure distribution, where the high pressures and where the lows are, those are not affected by wind speed but the magnitude of the differential is strongly affected by wind speed. So when you think about how we set sails, it's not that the wind is doing something different that causes us to trim differently for different wind speeds. It's that our objectives change. In very high wind speeds, we're basically driven to control the heel and leeway angle and that's what's driving our sail trim. We want less sail area and flatter sails. In very light winds, there's absolutely no problem with heel, and we're basically trying to set the sails just to get the boat moving. So we, we set a more open sail plan with fuller sails at a wider angle because our objective has changed to just get the boat moving and we're not trying to sail close to the wind because we can't. Another thing about light winds is that light winds are almost always variable winds. This plot shows the expected or average change in wind direction over 15 minutes 
as a function of the wind speed in knots. And as you can see, when the wind speeds pick up, the wind becomes more consistent. And that's probably just because wind has a lot of momentum at high speeds and it's just harder to change direction. But when the wind speed is light, you can almost guarantee that the wind direction is going to be changing constantly. And this is one of the things that makes sailing in light winds really tricky. So one of the things I was confused about when I was learning to sail was I got the idea that somehow we changed the trim of our sails in light winds because the air was doing something differently. And that's not the case. The actual path the air takes around our sails isn't affected by the wind speed, even though the forces are. The reason we trim differently for light winds is that our objectives change. The optimum velocity made good, if you think about that, occurs at a much broader apparent wind angle in light winds than it does in heavy winds. So we end up with an objective of sailing at a reach, and we trim the sails for a reach rather than close hauled. The other thing, of course, you find out is that in very light winds, all the energy tends to be in the puffs, and of course, currents have a huge effect on you when you're sailing in light winds. So good seamanship has a way of trumping anything to do with a sail trim under those conditions. Alright, now we're going to switch gears and think about sailing downwind. The VMG velocity made good calculation applies to any point of sail, but it's most interesting when you're trying to go straight upwind or straight downwind. And so now we're going to look at a, a destination which is straight downwind. And it's interesting, you'll see that when you work through the calculations, it really favors with white sails sailing with wing on wing whenever that's possible. And I'll explain why that occurs. Keep in mind with all these simulations, there's an assumption that the jib is being pulled out with a whisker pull in order to keep the sail shape correct. Here's a simulation of the J32 sailing at 130 degrees apparent wind, so that's a, a broad reach. And the first thing you notice is there's this big swirly mass behind the jib. That's stalled air and very turbulent, but of course in a downwind configuration, drag is our friend. Drag is actually pushing us towards our de destination. So although it's ugly airflow, it's actually helping us. If you look carefully at the area between the jib and the mainsail, you can see that there's some turbulence there, but the jib and mainsail are still working together. Air flows through the slot, and that tends to reattach airflow on the mainsail and also keep the jib inflated. So this is a fairly efficient sail configuration where both sails are working for us. And in this simulation, we've fallen off some more. We're now sailing at 170 degrees of apparent wind, so a very broad reach. And now the stalled area is extends so that the area between the mainsail and the jib is completely turbulent. So you have stalled air on both sides of the jib, which means the jib is going to be flapping back and forth and very unhappy. And if in this configuration, we'll see the jib is actually slowing us down a little bit. So this is not a very efficient way to sail. So in this simulation, we've fallen off to dead downwind, and the jib is pulled out to the opposite side from the mainsail. So this is commonly called wing on wing. Interesting that the sails actually complement each other in this configuration. If you look at the area between the mainsail and the jib, you can see that there's smooth airflow there now, and the jib is being properly pressurized. So this is a quite efficient way to sail your boat. So now we can look at some of these downwind cases numerically. This is a complicated chart, but I'll walk you through it. We're looking first at boat speed and versus apparent wind angle. The yellow line here is the boat speed with just the main up, no jib. And you can compare that with the blue line, which has the main at the same angle, 45 degrees from the boat center line, but also has the jib up. And you'll notice that having the jib up speeds us up a lot at low apparent wind angles, 
But as we move closer to straight downwind, the jib actually gets to the point where it's slowing us down. Look over at 180 degrees. You can see that the, the case with no jib is actually a bit faster than the case with the jib. Now the, the red and magenta lines are cases with the jib set, but we are starting to move the mainsail out to greater and greater angles. And as you would expect, it's helpful to get the mainsail boomed out as far as you can, although the effect diminishes after you get past about 60 degrees. Finally, there's that green X. That's the wing-on-wing -wing condition. And you notice at 180 degrees, apparent wind, straight down wind, wing-on-wing -wing is substantially faster than any other configuration. So this plot shows exactly the same data, except now we're plotting velocity made good towards the destination, which is straight down wind. All of these cases are at 10 knots of true wind. Now again, if you compare the yellow line where it's mainsail alone versus the blue line where you have the mainsail plus the jib, you can see that the jib is actually reducing the VMG for those cases above about 160 degrees of apparent wind. The real outlier here is the wing-on-wing -wing case, that green X on the right. You can see that it has a velocity made good that's substantially better than any other case. So we're going to basically favor wing-on-wing -wing whenever we can. The other interesting thing is that it's really quite flat uh, in terms of VMG from about 120 to 180 degrees when you have both sails out until you get to VMG. However, the optimum, the highest point, occurs at a low wind angle, relatively low, say 120 to 130 degrees. So those are the maximum angles where you have the jib still contributing when both sails are on the same side. So you can guess ahead as to what the optimum is going to be. We're going to want to sail wing on wing whenever we can. And if we can't sail wing on wing, we're going to want to sail at about 120 or 130 degrees apparent and never go beyond that unless we can go wing on wing. So in summary, you really never want to sail in a condition where the jib isn't inflated. Um, for the J32, this corresponds to avoiding sail angles between 120 and 180 degrees. At 180 degrees, straight down wind, we sail wing on wing. So to give an example, look on the right side. Imagine we have a mark one mile away, and the straight path is 160 degrees. So if we head right to it, we're going to have the jib blanketed the whole way. The faster route is to sail as much as possible wing on wing, and then switch over to a broad reach at 120 degrees apparent wind angle, so now the jib is again working for us. And the difference in speed is impressive. If there's 10 knots of true wind, the approach with wing on wing and then 120 degree broad reach will get to that mark two and a half minutes quicker than sailing straight at it. Well, this concludes part three of how sails really work. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation, and certainly feedback is welcome. Just to leave you with something else to think about, here are a few tricky questions that will test your knowledge. And just a bit of warning, these truly are tricky questions. The answers are probably not what you first think of. So give them a go and let me know how you do.